Good evening, everyone. My name is Mark Barnico. I'm the executive director of the Francis and Rose Human Campus uh, for the University of Chicago here in Hong Kong. And I want to welcome you to the program this evening. Um, we're honored to have our guest lecturer, Professor Ed Shaughnessy, uh, give a talk, in-person talk. We're thankful for that. Um, on the authenticity of rooted antiquities and the ethics of studying them. Um, as always, uh, this is being live streamed on Zoom and uh, Facebook and YouTube from the University of Chicago Human Campus here in Hong Kong. Um, we're also delighted to be partnering with our uh, center in Beijing. We have a U Chicago center in Beijing. Uh, and they put us in touch with um, the Paragon Book Gallery in Beijing. So in addition to Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube, we're also live streaming the talk on uh, WeChat tonight. This is our first time to do that, so we're really excited to do it. Um, there will be a Q&A session after about an hour or so lecture from Professor Shaughnessy, uh, and then we'll have 15 or 20 minutes of Q&A. So if you're on Zoom, try to stick with us uh, to the very end. Um, the Zoom audience members, they can, as always, submit their questions on the Q&A tab on uh, Zoom. Uh, and if you're in uh, the small classroom, because we might have overflow in person here on campus, if you're in the small classroom or on um, WeChat, you can submit your questions on the Google form that's been provided. So just wanted to mention that to you. Uh, as always, I'd also like to mention that you should uh, follow us at our UChicago website, www.uchicago.hk, so that you can keep in touch with us regarding all the great uh, lectures that faculty will be delivering here now that we're back in person. So uh, with that, let me introduce uh, Professor Ed Shaughnessy. I think many of you already know him. Uh, he's one of our senior most uh, faculty. He's the uh, Lorraine J. and Hurley T. Creel Distinguished Service Professor uh, in Early Chinese Studies and Director of uh, Graduate Studies at the Department of East Asian uh, Language and civilization at the University of Chicago. So we're really honored to have Professor Shaughnessy with us tonight. Um, Professor Shaughnessy has devoted must, much of his career to the cultural and literary history of China's Zhou dynasty. And he attempts to really bridge Western and Chinese traditions and scholarship and has written many of his technical scholarship in Chinese uh, and has published uh, seven volumes of essays in Chinese as well as three other books devoted to uh, specialized topics. So uh, very unique in uh, the Western academic world of publishing uh, in Chinese. Uh, he's published a 650 page book entitled the Chinese Annals in the Western Observatory, an overview of Western Sinologist studies of Chinese excavated documents, uh, which provides an overview of the Western studies of Chinese uh, paleography. And he's also served as a co-editor together with colleagues at Wuhan University uh, of a journal entitled uh, Bamboo and Silk, uh, which publishes primarily English language translation of articles that were originally published in Chinese. So again, uh, Professor Shaughnessy is really instrumental in helping us bridge the uh, language and cultural divide uh, that we have between the Chinese language and the English language. And we're really grateful for that. Um, tonight, he'll be examining four different robbed artifacts uh, and their authenticity and discuss the ethical issues of buying, repatriating, and studying those artifacts. So without further ado, uh, Professor Ed Sean. Thank you very much, Mark. It's, it's a real pleasure to be back here. I was here last in November of 2019. Um, there were problems then in the streets, but we didn't, I don't think anyone really anticipated that the problems would get into the air with the all breathing and then persist for three years. So uh, this has been really the first chance to go back to mainland China and, uh, and also Hong Kong. So um, a delight to be here. Let's hope that, that we'll all sort of return to normalcy with, uh, with the coming months and then the coming years. Um, so Mark mentioned a book that I wrote actually in Chinese called 
Chinese Annals in the Western Observatory. This is the 650 page book. And um, after I published it with the Shanghai Guji Chubai program in Shanghai, uh, then a, uh, an institute here in Hong Kong, the Raozong Academy of Sinology, Chinese Baptist University, where Adam Schwartz, who's sitting over here, teaches, uh, said, you know, we should have this in English. Um, we'll translate it. your Chinese. And I said, no, if we're going to translate it into English, then I'll just write it in English as well. Uh, but that was that writing this big, big book in Chinese was very instrumental for me. Because as Mark says, I spent a long time writing articles in Chinese. And my Chinese is good enough to pull off a 25, 30 page article without repeating the, the few grammatical constructions that I know too many times. But over the course of 500 pages, um, I, I found myself sort of using the same constructions over and over again. And then, so I wanted to start tonight with just a little overview of what I've been doing the last couple of years. COVID has been really hard in Hong Kong, right? It's been hard all over the world. So for me, it wasn't all that hard. I got to stay home um, and do what I do, do, just read and write. So, actually have lunch every day with my wife and then go for a walk after lunch. Um, I was pretty productive. And in fact, I thought I would just share with you some of the productivity that's come out in the last few months or will be coming out in the next couple of months. So the first thing to report is that I finally finished my doctoral dissertation. Uh, which they gave me a PhD for it back in 1983. But unlike most people who then use the next several years after they get a job to revise the dissertation and then publish it and get tenure, I never did that. And I kept putting it off and putting it off. And then finally in 2015, um, a uh, a project on in, my, in mainland China uh, invited me as a foreigner to write the book on the Yijing. They were putting together um, excavated sources and traditional sources, received literature. And of course, the first volume was dedicated to the Yijing deposit changes. And the directors of this project invited me to write this book. And of course, I was dumbfounded for the Chinese a project funded by the Chinese government in invite the forum to write this book on the most important of the Chinese classics. Um, but I couldn't, I couldn't say no, especially because the two directors were both very good friends of me. But I said I would do it on two conditions. Number one, that they give me a few years to write it. And number two, that I write it in English. And actually three conditions. And number three, that they assign a very bright young student who had just finished a postdoc in Chicago uh, to translate. Because I didn't want to translate, I didn't want to try and write another 500 page book in Chinese. So the book was finally published last year by Grip. It's what you see on the right-hand side of the screen, the origin and early development of the Joe changes almost 40 years after the PhD degree was in um, And then the Chinese translation was just published again by Shanghai Beach um, about two months ago. And it's uh, the book. Actually, the book is freely available. I, uh, I had so much trouble with Brill trying to um, deliver the book 
and it hasn't been available in the United States at all, that I finally just bought the rights to it. So it's open access. If you go to the Build website, you can just download a, uh, a PDF of it for free. Um, whatever the, the quality of that book may be, I have to say that the translation is beautiful. The Tiong one is, uh, has, has a wonderful sense of like the English language and the Chinese language. She's made herself an authority on the Joe changes and the, 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 the translation is great. Um, I have another book that's due out any week now, um, which has also been very long in the middle. Uh, even longer, in fact, A Brief History of Ancient China, being published by his son. Yeah, I could use this one too. Um, being published by Bloomsbury in London. And they too asked me to write, write a book like this. And I said, again, on two conditions. Number one, that I can take my time didn't want to start, and I had taken it. And I didn't start until until COVID, and I was sitting at home with uh, no other real excuse for, for not doing it. Um, and then the second thing that I said was that I wanted to write it my own way. And my own way is to adapt the format of China, Chinese dynastic history. So if you're familiar with the Shi Ji of Sima Chen, um, it's in five parts, the five different ways of presenting materials. Um, there are what are called the Ji, basic analysts. that are sort of the political histories of the dynasties. Um, and then there are tables, but I changed that a little bit, tables and graphs. So I could introduce maps and just tabular forms of uh, data presentation. Then essays that take up significant topics in the history of ancient China, like astronomy, geography, law, literature, uh, linguistics, um, literature, music, 10 of those, and then local histories, and then finally, biographies. And the biographies, of course, I wanted to, I had to include people like Confucius, and Confucius's disciples. But in addition to the, the great names, one of the things I wanted to do with this book was to include people that we've only gotten to know in the last 30 or 40 years because their tombs have been excavated. So there's a guy with the very happy name of Happy who died in 217 BC and was buried at Shuhubi in Hubei uh, province. Um, so there's a, a little biography of him. There's uh, a couple of other people who, who we now know only through archaeology. Um, uh, another person, for instance, is the, the great figure Fu Ha, um, who was the wife of King Wuding in the Shang Dynasty uh, was uh, sort of caused celeb back in the 1920s when it was found that she was a woman warrior and led troops into battle. This was about sort of the, the beginnings of women's liberation in China. She was an icon for that. Um, and, and that brings me to another thing I wanted to do with these biographies was to. Um, to introduce biographies of women. Because I sort of think, this is just a guess, but my guess is that 50% of the population in ancient China was female. But if you read the dynastic histories, you would never, you would never know that. They're out of the picture. So, and, and you can't make it up, but to the extent possible, I wanted to um, include my opportunities in there. So that's uh, it's a book that will be out. It's supposed to be geared 
for undergraduate students at American universities. Even though it's published in English, but they're looking for Americans to buy. Um, another book that I won't say very much about, but is due out in September, uh, Writing Early China, being published by um, SUNY Press, State University of New York, is kind of a collection of essays that take up the question of writing in early China and, and the important, uh, the significance of writing. And it is part of a debate that's been going on in the Western Academy for uh, 20, 30, maybe even 50 years about the transmission of knowledge, whether it was oral or knowledge could be transmitted in writing the way the books were written. And the, the excavated sources that we've had over the last 50 years, and particularly the last 15 to 20 years, uh, that show us what books were actually like in antiquity are, are making this more and more possible to talk about the role of writing in ancient China. Is not okay. Um, and that means that I can actually walk around. So, uh, is this better? Um, good. And then the last book, which just was published uh, a week ago, and is the the proximate reason why I'm here. Um, I'm sorry to say that I didn't come just to Hong Kong, but but I, I've been in Beijing the last two weeks and we had a book launch for this, which is the first volume of a complete translation, a series of translations of the Tsinghua University manuscripts from the Warring States period. I'm gonna talk about them a little bit tonight, um, but before we get to that, I'm gonna talk about bronzes. Because I know there's some people here who are interested in bronzes. But anyways, this, this is meant to be an 18 volume series that we hope will, uh, will be completed within the next seven or eight years. And this particular volume is about historical um, text that for the most part were included in a book called the Ujo Shu, the leftover Joe scriptures that is supposed to have been a, a quasi uh, a classical source after, in the same line as the Shang uh, classic documents by the exalted scriptures. Uh, this first volume was done by me. The second volume will also be by me coming out maybe by the end of the year or early next year. And then one after the other, we'll, uh, we'll go through 18 volumes. Um, so um, that's what I've been doing, just recording. I was last here in November of 2019, and I've been sitting at home in Chicago for the most um, um, but tonight, this, and, and I've got to explain too, that this lecture came about only about 10 days ago that Mark said, oh, you're going to be in, you're going to be here because we have a conference tomorrow, starting tomorrow, um, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, uh, that is entitled uh, The Future of China's Past just a, a, an opportunity to bring some younger scholars uh, together. And um, Mark said, well, since you're here, can you give a public lecture? I don't really have anything ready for a public lecture that, that would be of general interest. You know, I could give you a public lecture on the dating of a particular bronze vessel, but how many people would be interested in that? And, and then it occurred to me that this, this topic, the, uh, the authenticity of Chinese antiquities and the ethics of studying them are particularly relevant to Hong Kong because many of these, in fact, almost all of these antiquities 
have been filtered through the Hong Kong antique market, or at least that's the story that we hear. Um, and it sort of has to be that the, the antiquities are sent out to Hong Kong in order to then be purchased and repatriated. Um, so that has a Hong Kong angle to it. The question of the ethics of studying them is probably something that people who might not necessarily be interested in ancient China, but uh, are interested in contemporary China and in the scholarly world, uh, perhaps could be interesting. So it's, it's going to be a long talk, which I'm going to have to cut things out of. Uh, I gave it in Beijing on Zoom or on, on uh, uh, Tencent Tangshun in March, and I did it all in Chinese. So the slides are in Chinese. Uh, but then I figured I'm going to talk in English. The slides are in Chinese. Most people here can read them. And for those who can't read the Chinese, um, I'll, I'll just sort of highlight what it says. So the question is about the problem of robbing graves. And this is a problem that started uh, about 1990 in China. But no, it didn't start about 1990 in China. We go all the way back to the third century BC and people complain about tomb robbing all the time. So this is from the Lin Shu Chun Show, um, written, uh, presented at court at 238 BC and talks about you know, the, the, the richer the state, the, the richer the family, the, the more goods are put in the tomb. But this ironically is, is only an invitation to tomb robbers. And no sooner do people bury the, their dead than other people will come. And even though there are strict laws against it, um, people rob the tombs. And so that's just what this, this particular passage from the Leisure Trinchel says. It, the, the title of the passage of the chapter is moderation in, um, in humans, moderation in mourning. Um, we have another, another slide here from a, a different passage, a different chapter of the Leisure Trinchel, um, Peace in Death. Uh, that just says, you know, many of these states from earlier times, from the springs and autumns period, Chunzhou period, um, are already gone. So by the by the mid third century BC, they had been destroyed, and even their rulers, they could no longer protect the tombs of the rulers, um, and and then looking forward into the future, he said, this is gonna to happen to all of us. So if we can't, if, if people from the past couldn't protect the tombs of their rulers, how are we going to do that in the future when, when our, our dynasty also comes to an end? So just sort of um, predicting that all these tombs would be robbed. And then one, one last quote of this nature uh, from the Shunzi, also from the third century BC. And he said, he, he's predicting that if the world were at peace, if it had the Tao, then the robbers would change their ways. Um, and why would they do so? Not because they were uh, concerned with laws or anything like that, but it's just sort of the influence of a good government that would cause bandits to no longer rob tombs. Well, I mentioned that tomb robbing started again in China about 1990. Really the only period in at least modern Chinese history that I know of when there wasn't much 
if any, tomb robbing was between 1949 and 1978. And the reason I think was not because there was peace under heaven. So the Chinese expression here, Tian Xiai Wu Gao, but rather because everyone was too poor to be able to do anything with these antiquities. It didn't, it didn't make sense to dig up a tomb that then you wouldn't be able to sell the goods from. Uh, but once China's economy picked up again in the 1980s, and then particularly from 1990 on, um, a couple of things happened. Uh, um, construction projects all over the country, the, the building of the, the high-speed rail network, um, projects in cities and, and throughout the country of, of these construction. And, and every time you dug into the soil, you were likely to find some sort of antiquity and find out where others were, were buried. Um, and the second thing that happened is people got rich. And once they got rich, then they had money to go out and support an antiques market. And so that's what has driven this sur surge, or probably I should say scourge of tomb robbing that really has been a problem for the last 30 years. Since uh, since 1990, and it's it's a terrible problem, and and I'm going to come back to that at the very end about what Chinese scholars, particularly Chinese archaeologists, have to say about it. Um, but that's just all by way of background. Uh, Mark mentioned that I would talk about four different artifacts. Maybe I'll only talk about three tonight. Um, which are pictured here. And I'm, I'm just gonna rush through this because I could give you the whole, um, the whole background and all the, all the evidence uh, for the history of these pieces, but at least we'll have a chance to look at the pieces. Um, the, uh, the, the piece, the, the set on the right was sort of the first famous case of tumor. Um, and it was here in Hong Kong in 1993 and bought, or not bought, this was back when the Shanghai Museum still didn't have enough money to do things on its own. But there was a dean of the engineering school at Chinese University who bought these pieces for the Shanghai Museum. On the left, the top left is a piece that was purchased for the, the Bali Museum, the Poli Museum at Beijing in 2003. Um, and then what you can't really make out on the lower left are these bamboo slips from the Warring States period that were purchased by or for Tsinghua University. So, um, the first one, if you look at this, if you've been to the Shanghai Museum, you've probably seen this set of bronze bells. Um, if you look at it, you'll see that it's a little bit off center, especially the bottom row. And in fact, if you know anything about bronze bells, you would sort of guess that there's something missing. There are 14 of them, but bronze bells were always made in sets of four because they had to, um, they, they had to play octaves um, and they were two-toned bells. So they were in sets of four. So there should have been 16 of those bells, but here on the, ant uh, the antique market, there were only 14. Um, and there, there are only 14 of them in the Shanghai Museum. People were suspicious about them. Because first of all, they were supposedly robbed from a tomb and no one would say 
where it was from. Because of course, the antique dealers don't want to give away their sources and everyone knows this is all illegal. Um, but um, so there was that doubt about them. The second thing about them is that these were not all made at one time, but rather were pre-existing bells that were repurposed. And then the third thing about them, maybe the, the most suspicious aspect of them is that the inscription, very long inscription, 370 characters, I think it is, uh, unlike all, almost all other ancient Chinese bells, that the inscription was cast into the bell when the bell was made. These were carved into the cold bronze after the fact. So they took bells that were already in existence and carved this inscription. And people thought that's what forgers did. Well, most forgers wouldn't do that, actually. But anyways, this was, this was suspicious. And then the last thing that was very suspicious about this particular inscription that goes across the 14 bells is that it reads almost like a story. It, it's about a military campaign where the king goes off together with the ruler of the state of Jin and probably goes to Shandong to attack. Um, you want to read the inscription there as a part of it. This is called um, the Jin Ho Su Bian Zhong. Jin Ho Su is the Su is his personal name, the ruler of the state of Jin. Um, there, there's a lot of this. Uh, what, what I highlight there in red in about the fifth line or so, so that the, um, that the king arrives at Jin Ho Su's camp, the king gets down from his chariot and he faces south. This, this reads like um, the Shirji, a sort of a traditional Chinese history. It's not very much like most Western Joe Bronze inscriptions. Um, So there, there are other problems about the authenticity of this, the date of this particular figure. He's supposed to have reigned from the, uh, uh, the sixth to the 16th year of King Shen of the Western Zhou, the next to the last king of the dynasty. And yet the inscription itself has a date of the king's 33rd year. So in the preceding king, this guy wasn't the ruler of Jin yet. In the king, King Shen's reign, he was already apparently dead if we accept the chronology of Sima Chen. Um, so there, there are a number of problems with this inscription. Um, I've always said that. There is the date, it's the king's 33rd year, and so forth. Um, but this all happened in 1993. Um, in December of 1993, I was passing through the Shanghai Museum and the then director of the museum, Ma Chung Yan, very excitedly took me to the um, to the, um, the Dongan uh, of, of Shanghai, where these were being kept while the new museum was being built, and showed me this, this is the great, the great real uh, uh, contribution to the, uh, to the Shanghai Museum. But right at that time, in Shanxi province, uh, near the, the city of Homa, the site called Tianma Chusun, Chusun, archaeologist opened up a tomb that had been robbed in the summer before that. And they discovered, so the tomb robbers actually did this by putting sticks of dynamite in to open up a hole into the tomb. The tomb robbers cleaned out all of the antiquities that were on either side of the coffin. 
but they didn't, their, their um, trench into the tomb didn't touch the top of the coffin, the, the head, not the top of the coffin, but the area behind where the person's head was. When the archeologists cleaned the tomb, they discovered among a few other antiquities, two little bells. Two little bells that completed the set. So made bells number 15 and 16, and these are all bells graduated in size, and that completed the inscription uh, with the characters that were missing on those other 14 bells. And what's more, they discovered that these bells that were buried in the tomb, the inscription was also carved into the cold metal of the bell rather than cast in. So now the Shanghai Museum knows exactly where this came from. Um, it's tomb number eight at Tianma Chuzun, uh, buried somewhere around 800 BC. Of course, that prompted a, a bit of a battle um, in China because the archeologist in Shanxi province said, you stole our bronzes, they're in the Shanghai Museum, but but you know, we really want them back in Shanghai Museum. So these are bought and paid for. They're here in Shanghai and they're not leaving. Um, so we now have the 14 bells in the Shanghai Museum with the space for the two little ones. And the two little ones are back in the local museum. Let me skip that. The next slide. In the interest of time, jump to this particular bronze, which is in the Poly Museum of Beijing. Um, it's called the Bingong Shu or the Poly Museum. It refers to it as the Sui Gong Shu. Um, and here, too, I, I know a little bit about this because I've been once again at the Shanghai Museum in the, uh, actually, it was in. Uh, 2002, I'm saying 2002. Um, that uh, was in Chile, uh, working at the Shanghai Museum. And they had just been working with this particular bronze that the Poly Museum had sent to Shanghai to be cleaned and examined because there were suspicions about this bronze. So much about the book. Um, and not so much about the inscription, this is cast in, except about the type of inscription that it is. If you read this, whether in the Chinese on the left hand side or the English on the right hand side, it's totally unusual, unusual for this early period. It tells the story about the great Yu, who is supposed to uh, uh, control the floodwaters of ancient China by instead of damming the, 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 the waters up, opening channels to the sea so the water could flow out and, and then making the nine regions of China uh, going on how heaven uh, or um, uh, the, uh, what is it? It's heaven who makes a ruler for the people. And because the ruler is good, then everything is, this is where Tian Shai Yu Dao, this is where, where the world is at peace. And one of the things that, uh, that I, I always found amusing um, that uh, it talks about virtue. One of the very early pieces you know, of not only theology, but also sort of ethics. And when the heart loves virtue, marriage relations are also concordant. Um, so uh, this is, there weren't any divorces in this. Um, 
And, and then it ends up with this sort of statement at the end that Bing Gong said, he just comes up from nowhere. Uh, if only the people can use this virtue, there will be no regret. We've never seen a bronze, a bronze inscription, anything like this. And when I first saw it, this, this is too unusual. Nobody would have cast this. And in fact, Ma Chung Yuan, the person who probably saw more ancient bronze vessels than anyone else, at least in the 20th century, said he too, when he looked at the inscription, said it has to be fake. But he subjected it to every test he needed, and he passed every one of the tests. Um, there's nothing wrong with this vessel. There's nothing wrong with the inscription. The inscription was certainly cast in um, at the time that the vessel was cast. How do we know that? Um, and I'm going to just skip through here. All of these red circles that you see are around little chaplets that were put inside the the mold assemblage at the time of casting to ensure that the inscription would remain stable, the area around the, the inscription. And they then fused together with the, the molten bronze. But sometimes you can see them with the naked eye. If you can't see them with the naked eye, you can almost always see them in x-rays. And these chaplets are exactly where we would expect them to be we know about casting techniques in particular. And uh, that they prove that the inscription was made at the, was cast into the vessel with the technique that was used in antiquity. There's nothing wrong with the, the vessel. There's nothing wrong with the inscription. And now uh, sort of histories of Chinese literature have to start with a new a new chapter, which is this particular bronze. It's really unusual and to that very important. Um, if we'd had time, I would have spent a little bit of time talking about uh, bamboo slips that the Shanghai Museum purchased uh, just about the same time that they purchased those bells. Or maybe I should say that someone purchased for them. But, but in this case, I think actually the Shanghai Museum came up with some money. But once again, in the interest of time, this is something that's going to be more confusing. And I, I do want to get to the ethics of this. Um, but you know, I came here on this trip because of the Qinghua manuscript. And the Tsinghua manuscripts were also out here in Hong Kong. Uh, we started hearing rumors about a significant cache of Warring States manuscripts in 2006. And um, a professor who used to be at the, the Chinese University was the person who was always shown these, these antiquities first. And they were, they were shopping these around for a while, uh, but apparently the price was too high. And uh, it took another two years before Tsinghua dispatched the director of their early China center, basically, um, Li Zhiqin. Uh, Li Zhiqin was certainly the most renowned historian of all aspects of ancient China. Uh, he passed away four years ago, 19, uh, 2019, but uh, a truly great scholar and very, uh, very much respected by Tsinghua. And they gave him kind of a blank check. He went, he came to Hong Kong, he looked at these, he only saw a few slips and he decided immediately that he needed them. There are about 2,000 slips in all, some 75 different texts. Some of them is short, there's just four or five slips. Some of them as long as 135 slips. Running the gamut, 
from ancient literature, ancient poetry. Um, the text that Adam was translating is on divination, method of divination, which is sort of related to the Ijin. Um, text about uh, histories, um, all sorts of texts. And they're, they're truly, truly exceptional. Some of them, some of the text that we know, other texts that we've never seen before. Uh, Tsinghua began editing them immediately. And they, uh, they issued the first volume uh, two years later, which is almost record time for the editing of these kinds of manuscripts. And the manuscripts are from the fourth century BC, maybe anywhere from 350 to 300 BC. Uh, and they've now issued the 12th volume of what they anticipate to be 15 or 16 volumes in all. So I mentioned that we are going to translate all of these texts in 18 volumes, but uh, uh, there will be uh, mainly correlation with, with the volumes they've done. This is, I, I can't talk about the entire cache of manuscripts here. Just want to talk about the authenticity. And in volume seven, of the Qinghua manuscripts, there was a text that, the Qing, that didn't have a title to it, but the Qinghua editors called Yuegun Qi Shi. So if you know the history of the, uh, the late sixth and early fifth centuries BC um, in the area south of the Yangtze River, there were two states, the states of Wu and Yue, and they fought each other back and forth. And this is about the ruler of one of these states, the ruler of Yue. Uh, and they gave it the title, Yue Gong Qi Shi. This was uh, published at the end of 2016, something that no one had ever seen before. It's, yeah, it's they won't do anything by it. The point of it that anyways. Um, it's a very long text, 75 slips in the uh, Qinghua manuscript. As luck would have it in 2017, in Hubei province, archeologists opened another tomb and found another text that's almost identical to this year when she should. So just one year after the Qinghua manuscript, was formally published by the Zhongxi Shuju of Shana. Um, but what does that mean? This Tsinghua manuscript couldn't possibly have been a forgery because it matches exactly a, a text that was excavated by archeologists. So that, that gave, and, and there's no one in China almost no one who doubts the authenticity of these texts, these manuscripts. But if there were anyone, this would, I think, dispel any doubts that they should have about the authenticity. Um, I apologize for racing through this. We still have more to go, and we're almost at an hour. Um, so I'm going to uh, to go through this. Um, these, I think, if I just characterize these three discoveries, um, imagine the contribution that they make. Um, the Jinho Su Bian Zhong at the Shanghai Museum. 14 bells, or now we know 16 bells, which really, really contribute to our understanding of ancient history, of the way relations between the Zhou court and this very important state of Jin were conducted, 
Um, and also something about the making of inscriptions and uh, inscribing them into old metal. It's a, a really important discovery. The Bin Gong Shi, as they call it, the Sui Gong Shi, uh, this new challenger in the history of Chinese literature. It's wonderful. Everything that we write about Chinese literature now really should start with the Bin Gong Shi. And then these Qingfa manuscripts, 75 different manuscripts, touching on all sorts of aspects of the intellectual world of the fourth century of the city. The, the period just after the time of Confucius, the time when Mencius was alive, the time when Zhuangzi was alive. Now we can see text. I don't want to say that that Mengzi and Zhuangzi were reading, but that were sort of in the air when they were thinking about their thoughts, and perhaps writing their writings. Uh, so they're, they're, these are tremendously important discoveries that scholars are going to be talking about for decades and decades to come. Uh, but there is this problem of ethics. Um, and the problem of ethics has been raised by some Western scholars, Western sinologists, and it's not a, an, an empty problem that they raise. It's very much a problem in the, uh, the international art market, uh, in museums in the West, and we all know. Um, you know, when I was putting this talk together uh, at, the, at the end of the year, last year, the beginning of the year, here the New York Times had an article with, for US museums with looted art, the Indiana Jones era is over. Going through that museums all over the United States are sending antiquities back to their home countries. Some of you may have heard about the, the Museum of the Bible in Washington that purchased tens of thousands of, um, of uh, cuneiform manuscripts from, it's not manuscripts, but cuneiform text from Iraq. These are the texts that were looted from the Iraqi National Museum. Um, shortly after the American invasion of Iraq back in 2002, um, we know where they came from. And they shouldn't be in that museum. And they should be sent back. And they're, they're being sent back. But it's not just those. Um, on, the, uh, on the left of the slide are the Benin bronzes. And we know that the Benin bronzes were looted by the English army in the 1890s and then sold to museums all over England and the United States. And now little by little, they're being sent back. The University of Pennsylvania Museum is sort of taking the lead in sending their bronzes back. Of course, there are other really important looted antiquities, um, the, uh, uh, the Parthenon, Belgian marbles, that are in the British Museum. I think I, I think we may live to see the day when those are back in Athens. I, I think that's going to happen. Um, there, there are a lot of discussions going on there that will lead in that direction. Uh, the Rosetta Stone, which is at the Louvre, um, of course looted by Napoleon's army in 1803, something like that. Uh, we know very well where it came from. And, you know, people say, well, it was looted in traditional times and therefore uh, doesn't sort of count. But maybe it should count. It's been a little more than 50 years that the United Nations um, has had a convention signed by most countries in the world on 
prohibiting and preventing the illicit import, export, and transfer of ownership of cultural property. And here I have it in English. Um, these are several several codicils from Article 7. A, it's illegal to export and antiquities from one state member state of this convention to another member state. Um, it's illegal to import cultural property. And if any cultural property is in another state, those states should take the responsibility, the appropriate steps to recover and return these, this, this property. Um, here it is in Chinese, if anyone wants to read it in Chinese, uh, says the same thing. Everything in red is just uh, that, that's codice of one, um, codice of two. Um, and then codice of three, it's all about the export and the input of cultural property. In the United States, several cultural organizations, the, the Penn Museum for one, uh, in 1978 issued a proclamation that they would not um, exhibit any, any property that had been looted prior to 1949. 1949 is sort of the cutoff date, which doesn't have anything to do with the the, the revolution in China, it's just uh, many, for, for many things, the first half of the 20th century pertains to traditional times, the second half of the 20th century pertains to modern times. Doesn't make any sense, but they are. Um, and that they wouldn't publish anything having to do with needed manuscripts. The uh, uh, a couple of the archaeological associations in the United States also issued similar kinds of statements on their uh, on their journals, saying that they wouldn't publish anything that was uh, the result of looting uh, in their in their materials. Um, is just just a slide to say that in the United States. More recently, uh, this just what I was looking at, several different museums were sending their antiquities back to home countries. Uh, and you know, this includes also uh, religious artifacts that have been looted from Italian churches, for instance. The Metropolitan Museum has had to send many of their uh, pieces back to Italy. Um, then they get them back again on long-term loan, but the, the ownership has now been transferred out of the museum and back to the Italian authorities. Um, and, and then finally, for the purposes of this, uh, a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, Paul Gold, uh, wrote an article about 10 years ago, I think it was 2014, in which he was discussing one of the one of the artifacts, one of the manuscripts that was purchased by the Shanghai Museum in 1994. Um, but he then added that he would thereafter no longer talk about um, looted manuscripts because he said that the Western well, scholar, the scholarly world in general, he could only speak for the Western scholarly world by talking about these looted uh, antiquities uh, was sort of spurring on the looters, uh, increasing the, um, the prestige of these things and therefore raising the value and then you get into a vicious circle that because these are now more valuable, therefore robbers have more incentive to, to rob. And, and then 
so on and so forth. Um, so he said that he wouldn't say anything more about them, though, of course, he did say something more about them in a very recent article, uh, The Problem of Rooted End Artifacts in Chinese Studies. And um, here, I don't need to, uh, to read this to you, um, but it's just this argument that scholars who will talk about these materials are complicit, it seems, uh, are effectively complicit, especially if they're authenticated. Or, I'm sorry, not problems, but these, these artifacts. Uh, but even just by studying them, it enhances their value and effectively uh, authenticates them and makes them complicit. And referring to rooted artifacts in print is tantamount to authenticating them. Therefore, scholars must refrain from doing so. Those are pretty strong words. Uh, imagine if we didn't talk about the Jinho Su bells. We didn't talk about the uh, uh, the Bingong Shu. We threw this chapter of Chinese literature out the window. If we didn't study, if we didn't translate the Qinghua manuscripts, what kind of a loss that would be uh, for scholarship. Um, so there, there has been a flurry of discussion of this issue, uh, both pro and con. There are people who support Professor Golden's position, people who don't support it. Um, uh, Martin Kern, uh, a very prominent scholar at Princeton University, uh, has talked about it in, in very conflicted terms. I understand what Professor Golden is saying. On the other hand, I'm writing about a Qinghua manuscript, which is a, an early poem, Xi Chuan, and it's really interesting and I really want to talk about it. So even though I appreciate Professor Golden's position, I'm still going to talk about the Xi Chuan poem. Um, it's, he says these are too important to ignore. Um, there it is in, in Chinese, if you want it. Um, Lothar Falkenhaus, important um, archaeologist of ancient China who was taught for a long time at UCLA, in a book review um, of a book by Yuri, Yuri Penis, who's a um, scholar at Jerusalem Univers University of Jerusalem, um, who was working with one of the Qinghua manuscripts, so a translation of one of the Qinghua manuscripts. And he says this is just too important not to pay attention to. But more important than that, uh, Professor Falkenhausen goes on and gives at least three reasons why um, Professor Golden's argument probably is not persuasive, is not going to be persuasive. First of all, that these artifacts have been returned to their mother. We know where they came from. No. In the case of the, uh, the Shanghai Museum bells, we know exactly the tomb they came from. Uh, the, the manuscripts all come from probably Hubei province very near to Wuhan. Um, so they've gone back to China. Um, Falkenhausen says they're in public institutions. So they're either in museums in China or in universities. And these universities have proven to be very good custodians of the artifacts. And Tsinghua University, for instance, has invested enormous sums of money in conserving them, and preserving them and publishing, them, making them making them available. And even now, Chinhua is providing sums for our translation into English. And they're being published by Chinhua University Press. 
the translation. So uh, these are public institutions that are not going into private hands. And um, they've already been published. So if they've already been published, why wouldn't you talk? They're in the public domain. And then Falkenhausen goes on with a, a bit of a rhetorical flourish um, that made Professor Golden very angry. But he says uh, that these are Western scholars who are talking about these ethical issues as if Chinese scholars are not worried about ethical issues. And he says this has the smell of imperialism to it. Um, and and Professor Golden then replied that I don't smell like an imperialist, but um, it's it's what these kinds of discussions sometimes devolve into. Um, yes, here. Um, uh, he uh, in in this most recent article of his, he says that that I don't understand, I, and Sean is um, uh, don't understand repatriation is not the issue. An artifact, uh, repatriating an artifact does nothing to mitigate the pernicious consequences of loot. And there he cites me, seems still to misunderstand this point. I, I don't misunderstand it at all. Um, in fact, repatriation has done a great deal to mitigate the pernicious consequences of loot. We all agree that in an ideal world, if there, if Tian Xiao Dao, if the world were at peace and there were no robbers, that would be the ideal state. Uh, we might even question whether archaeologists are sort of tomb robbers in their own way, but that's not the case. Tombs are being robbed all the time. Um, repatriation to institutions such as the Shanghai Museum, such as Tsinghua University, uh, have been very important in um, mitigating the consequences. If we just had these things robbed and then left on the antique market, sold to collectors wherever they might be who would not make them public, that would be a great loss. Um, this is not to say that we ought to incentivize too well, but once it's happened, then um, I, it seems to me that these institutions are bearing their responsibility to preserve the tradition of China. Uh, and, and just to close on kind of a rhetorical flourish that might, uh, might respond to Professor Falkenhausen's smell and stench of imperialism, um, there, there's an old saying in China um, that kind of a joke that someone in the state of Chu which is where most of these manuscripts come from, uh, the area around Wuhan in, uh, in the Hubei province. Uh, but there was someone from Chu who lost his bow. And they said to the king, well, uh, the king said, doesn't matter. Someone from Chu lost his bow. Someone from Chu will have found it. So there's no great loss. And, and then Confucius is supposed to have said, this is of course all apocryphal, but Confucius is supposed to have said, this would be even better if he dropped the word true out of this, that just someone lost his bow and someone found it. So there's, there's no great loss involved. Well, in today's world, we're not at that level of Tian Xia Yudao, that the world is all at peace and we're all one under heaven. We have different countries. And the UNESCO Convention of 1970 recognizes that, that it um, is against the illicit exploitation 
or importation of cultural artifacts from one member state to another member state. China is a signatory to that convention. Most Western countries are also signatories to that convention. As long as these artifacts are repatriated, they don't contravene the terms of the United Nations Convention. It's not ideal, but it's the world we live in. And until such a time as we have Tian Xia Rudao, I think we have to work with that. So um, I apologize again for racing, but um, it was uh, trying to get through all of this within an hour. Thank you very much for listening. Hey, Professor, if you'll stick around for a little while, we have a couple questions. For those of you in the room here, if you have a question, you can press this uh, button on the silver and when it lights green, um, we'll be able to hear you more clearly. So who wants to start us off? Professor, uh, 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 so the, the opinion of Professor Paul Golden that there's this feedback loop of scholars studying this kind of looted antiquities and this will raise the market value of these like looted objects and this will incentivize the looters do we have like uh, empir empirical studies of how antiquity market work and because uh, for me as i understand like the rich collectors incentivize the looting and antiquity market so like if we can better understand the actual machinations of antiquity market, especially here in Hong Kong, and we may be better like regulate and uh, disincentivize the, the looting from the like from its origin. So I don't know if there are research on that. I don't know if there's research on it either. Um, there are people in Hong Kong who are far better placed than I am to respond to that. Uh, I, I can I can say a couple of things. Um, Hong Kong, of course, has played an important role in being the middleman, just as it's played for the last 180 years or so in Chinese history between China and the outside world. Uh, but if we really want to stop this trade, it needs to be stopped at the source. Uh, and the Chinese government is well aware of this, and it has done things to stop it. Uh, for instance, I remember in 2003, so this was a, a year that things were being found outside of China as well, uh, in the antique market. But in Shanxi province, to the west of Xi'an, there, uh, were, there was a group of peasants who were digging dirt for a brick foundry, and they uncovered a wonderful cache of bronze vessels, 27 bronze vessels, really important inscriptions on them. And rather than calling the local antique dealer and selling them, they called the, uh, the archaeologists, the local archaeologists. Uh, they didn't get anything for that, except they were very quickly taken to Beijing, put on television. They were given a reception in the Great Hall of the People. And I think they actually were paid probably considerably more by the government than they would have gotten from the remote dealer. Um, that was an attempt to, to publicize that if you do the right thing and call the local archaeologists, that the authorities will reward them. It hasn't stopped to me. Um, and, you know, there always, there always been problems in China of uh, maintaining the tombs. And um, I, you know, it goes back to the third century BC, as I said in, at the beginning of the talk. Uh, is, there, is there some study that has been made of the, the Hong Kong antique? Again, I, I don't know. Um, you're here to do such a study. I'd be, I'd be delighted to hear 
whatever results you come up with. Um, but again, I suspect that it needs to be dealt with at the source uh, back within mainland China. Other questions? Yeah. Um, Professor, you, you are going to, um, if um, you just raised that uh, we should solve the problem from the source, then why these uh, people who, who stole all those uh, antiques are being charged? And if they are not, what's the reason that they are not being charged? That the Tao doesn't exist under heaven at this point. Um, you know, when we first started hearing about um, from boots coming out to Hong Kong, um, there were rumors, lots of, in fact, I, I know very well who robbed that tomb M8 in uh, uh, near Homa, Shanxi. Uh, he was the son of the, uh, the local one would be Juja, the, the director of public public order, or whatever the, the one would be, uh, not the one would be, the one. Uh, at least everyone in that town knew about that. Uh, he was protected. There, there were also rumors that um, the People's Liberation Army was complicit in transporting these things to Hong Kong. 14 big bells like that, you don't just put them in your suitcase and take them on the next flight to Hong Kong. But these are all rumors. Uh, we don't know. But, you know, as with, as, as with any sort of organized crime, and this is a crime. No question about it. this is a crime. Um, that with any organized crime, there is a lot of money involved, which buys a lot of protection. And so I, I'm not a, a state prosecutor. I don't know. I, I wouldn't know how to, uh, to resolve the problem. But, uh, I know that Chinese archaeologists are, are very concerned about, about it. And, whether or not that means that the, the Chinese government is still taking effective measures to combat this type. Again, I don't know. Professor, I have a couple of questions um, from the online audience. Um, I'm gonna merge them together. And uh, I wanted to talk a little bit more about authenticity and the, you know, we've had our own scandals in the West regarding authenticity of works, whether they be Chinese or not. Um, I'm wondering how uh, we can avoid herd mentality when it comes to um, authenticity. The comment you made earlier about, you know, all the experts, this is indisputable. Um, do you bring a unique perspective as a Western scholar to kind of help uh, look at the other point of view that these might not be authentic uh, pieces of artifacts? And then, you know, sort of a follow-on question to that, are there DNA techniques that are being used today uh, to uh, validate or confirm that artifacts are actually, in fact, genuine? Um, it's a complicated, complicated question for which I could speak another hour or two. Uh, in short, the probably best um, ways to authenticate these are traditional connoisseurship. Uh, there are people in China who are extremely well versed in what, what these artifacts should look like. I, I'll just mention that there are some ways to authenticate them. Um, and the the bamboo strips, for instance. Uh, Peking University also bought two significant caches of bamboo strips in 2008, I believe it was. Was it 2008 that, uh, that they bought them? And um, the, the professors at Beida were there 
holding the strips, looking at the writing on the one side of them. And there was the very bright young undergraduate, I think it was um, who was sitting on the other side of the table. And he couldn't see the right because he was on the other side of the desk. But as he was looking, he noticed that there were these scratches on the back side of the strips. And that he noticed if people put strips together, these scratches would line up. And once he called the attention to, to this, um, people discovered that in all of the archeologically excavated examples, they have the same scratch marks on the back. And apparently it was produced. And this is, there's no certainty about this, but apparently you take the comb of bamboo, the tooth of bamboo, and cut it to the length that you wanted it, and then cut it in slips going down. But before you did that, you would take a knife and just make a scratch mark around that would then remind you of the best order in which to put things. Um, what's important about that is that all of the looted antiquities that were available prior to 2008, if they show the same feature, that means probably with considerable certainty that no forger could have known about this. Nobody knew about it. Um, now, of course, it doesn't, it doesn't help now. Everybody knows that the facts that the slips are supposed to have these scratch marks on them. So if someone were to forge a, a manuscript today, they would probably do that. But at least those manuscripts um, have been authenticated to that extent. Uh, all of the institutions subject the, the bamboo strips to carbon-14 dating, and they all pass the carbon-14 dating. Um, people claim that the Chinese authorities only subject blank strips to the carbon-14. In all of these caches, there are mainly strips with writing on them, but also some without any. And, you know, in the Chinese context, where writing is all important. If you have some slips that don't have writing, then they're disposable. And carbon-14 dating destroys a certain amount of the organic material. And so they're willing to do that to, to those slips. Um, people say, but if you could test the date, the carbon-14 dating of the ink that's used, but to do that, you have to destroy part of the text. And people aren't willing to do that. Um, is there a unique um, role that Western science has to, to, to do with this? I don't think so. Um, uh, you know, there, there's some sense that Western scholars can be an independent um, sort of judge of, of these things or, or Western laboratories can bring in a, uh, a confirming role, if not a, a corroborating role, if not a, uh, a, an independent role. Uh, just in, in reality, the Chinese authorities are not going to allow these, these pieces to, to circulate outside, outside of the national borders of China. And we have to trust Chinese laboratories. Um, do you trust Chinese laboratories? Uh, it, that, that question raises smiles here in the audience. Uh, you know, herd mentality. Uh, maybe, but I, I have enormous respect for my colleagues in China who um, study these manuscripts. They're really good. They're really good. And they know so much more about these manuscripts than I do. And frankly, I know more than most people in the West. So that you know, we, we start going down the chain 
and I don't think there are too many people in the Western world who could serve that purpose of doing a better job than China. But it's a moot question because it's just not going to happen. Maybe time for one more question, Aaron. Hi, Professor Shaughnessy. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation. Um, I was surprised at you know the irregularities that you mentioned and how they revealed a break from the rarefied notion of the past based on the sample sets that we've been able to recuperate. Right? And all three examples reveal the past ancestors as being very clever and creative. So that what looked as oddities were in fact not oddities within that time frame. Which, and then after your response to the most recent question, I, I was wondering, are the cases of a recovered artifact that is with questionable authentic status that after the battery of testing is authenticated as being more than likely it is very authentic. However, it is so outside of the norm of what has been recuperated from the past and authenticated that it was just so odd that maybe people decided to just not talk about it or repress it. Have there been any cases of anything like that? I don't think so, but what you're talking about are two different stages in the process. One is in the original production of these materials in antiquity. And so the suggestion may be that these were the kinds of things that people sort of do in the privacy of their own bedroom or something, but don't talk about um, publicly. And that's why they weren't um, transmitted to, to later times. Or is it the, the case of today that these things are, are so unusual that maybe people don't talk about them? Um, I think rather what it really shows is just how little we actually know about antiquity. You know, there, there's some sense of a kind of Darwinian survival of the fittest from ancient China that Confucius you know, left us his sayings and because they, they were so brilliant that they outshined everything else. And so what, whatever else was lost was not transmitted to, to later times, wasn't worth transmitting. I don't think that's the case. I, I, I really don't think that knowledge is transmitted in that way. It's just kind of the luck of the draw. And it, if, we, if we look at traditional Chinese literature, we can actually find all sorts of literature that's very similar to the, the literature that's being discovered today. Uh, but I, I think it, it, these kinds of discoveries uh, if they serve a real purpose, it ought to be to remind us just of how little we actually know. And if we think that today, May the 2nd of 2023, is the end of this period of discovery, I think we're very deluded in thinking that. I think these kinds of discoveries are going to be, continue to be made. And a hundred years from now, you know, there will be many, many more such discoveries. We'll know more about ancient China. We, we won't know everything that there was by any means, but we'll know more. Um, I, one thing that I, I suppose I would say is that there was one significant cache of bamboo slips purported to be from ancient China that was bought by a particular university museum. I, I think I'm not going to say the name of it. Um, everybody knows that they're fake. And one of the things about those is 
that they actually replicate transmitted literature. There's a whole section that just quotes the Zor Dwan. Um, and um, it, it, there are all sorts of reasons why these have been demonstrated to be false. But actually in China, nobody talks about them because the person who bought them is a friend of everybody else. And to, to sort of uh, pile on and say, you know, you made a mistake and you spent a lot of money to buy forgeries that would just embarrass him. It's just been decided that no one will talk about this, um, but everyone knows. That's, that's a case where whoever forged these simply went to the library and started writing sections of a transmitted text into sort of ancient characters. But, uh, you know, forgers um, probably don't work that way. Um, or actually forgers probably work that way. These kinds of materials that we have here that are so, as you say, sort of outside the norm, what forgery would create an artifact such as that that doesn't look like anything you have seen before? Wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. So, um, anyways, the uh, the the question of the interplay between excavated sources and transmitted the transmitted um, heritage of China is a very interesting one that maybe has to be left for another another occasion. I'd love to talk talk about it with you though. Thank you so much, Professor. We can't wait to have you back and uh, hear long, long versions of the presentation. There's so much to talk about. Um, Professor Shaughnessy, you're a real inspiration too. I know a lot of your students here in the audience and to myself for helping bridge our cultural understanding. Um, but I'm really also inspired by how many books you wrote during COVID. That's amazing. <laughs> Congratulations. I wish I had been as productive during COVID as you were. Um, I just have a couple of announcements here and then we'll say goodbye to our online audience. Um, we do have some upcoming events. Uh, we have an event on May 11th that is um, in conjunction with the US consulate uh, called Women in Sustainable Finance. That's happening May 11th. Um, we have also uh, some other online programs that we'll be doing with faculty from New Chicago who haven't flown here or won't be flying here. Uh, and one is on um, a topic, it's a, I think I talked about it last time, a framework for systemic discrimination and how to identify when we're surrounded by systemic uh, discrimination. Um, I'd also like to just mention for those of you that don't know, we have a we have our own podcast here on this campus. Uh, we have about 93 episodes or so now, and we hope Professor Chaunasi will be one of those uh, episodes upcoming. Um, this doesn't focus so much on the research that our faculty do, although it does touch on it somewhat, but uh, it talks more about the path that our uh, faculty took to become uh, professors at the University of Chicago. And there's so many interesting stories um, that I hope I and encourage you to, to listen to the podcast. So um, to our online audience on Zoom and to everybody here in the room, I want to thank you for joining us tonight uh, and have a great evening, all of you. Thank you so much for joining us.